The Unshackled Waves, episode 135. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One human rights crisis that is finally gaining some international attention is the brutal attacks and murders of white farmers in South Africa. Over 400 farm attacks occurred in 2017, with a white farmer being murdered more than once a week. This assault on white farmers has been enabled by the South African government, which recently passed a motion to confiscate white farmers' land without compensation in one of the first actions by new president Cyril Ramaphosa. Many in the West and here in Australia are concerned for the welfare of white South Africans. There is a push for them to be accepted here as refugees. Of course, because they are white, it doesn't generate any interest from the usual human rights crowd and the mainstream media. White South Africans, however, are not leaving their land without a fight or allowing themselves to be sitting ducks. One organisation which has been preparing whites for this moment is Zeitlanders, which was founded in 2006. It aims to prepare and protect uh, civilian Afrikaners in the event of a civil war and has developed an emergency plan and safe areas for the Afrikaners. To learn about the full extent of the situation in South Africa and what it is likely to follow, we are lucky to be joined this week by Zeitlanders spokesperson, Simon Roach. Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me on The Unshackled, Tim. Now, the situation for whites in South Africa, it's really reached a crisis point now, but this didn't happen all overnight. It's been brewing for uh, a number of years and your organisation has been in place for over a decade. Uh, When did these uh, farm attacks and farm murders uh, begin? Tim, there has been a gradual increase in violent crime since the African National Congress assumed power in 1994. In fact, strictly speaking, there was quite a lot of uh, crime and lawlessness and violence prior to 1994, then it eased off a bit in 1993 and 1994 and indeed 1995, um, and then picked up again from about 1996. It's increased gradually, 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 and now we're in a situation where year on year, January, February 2017 versus January, February 2018, the uh, number of farm attacks has increased by almost 500 percent. That is to say, um, from about 22 registered severe attacks over January, February 2017 to 102 official figures in 2018 over the same two months, unofficially 119. That gives you some indication, I think. And of course, this has been uh, enabled by the uh, ruling African National Congress, which, as you mentioned, has uh, ruled South Africa since 1994. And it's not just that uh, politicians are are turning a blind eye. They're also actively inciting at some of them. Oh, absolutely. You know, you can imagine for yourself, uh, Tim, let's say you were, uh, I don't know, a, a Buddhist for argument's sake. And I was a Hindu, and we lived in a country that was kind of divided uh, historically, (coughs) very different cultures, languages, religions, traditions, histories. And um, let's say I uh, started walking around saying, well, you know, Tim, uh, he's not such a good guy, and you know, his religion is not so good. You can imagine for yourself, over time, it would brew resentment amongst my people towards you and you're very correct to say that the that the politicians have goaded this they've antagonized it they've they've um, almost initiated it our president former president jacob zuma was famous for singing the song kill the farmer kill the boer now any person with a shred of common sense would be able to work out for themselves that that is bound to have an effect on the mind of the average simpleton, poorly educated, from a background that 
is not a highly intellectual background. Let's say you're a simple, simple person. And you hear your president saying this over and over and over again. Kill the farmer, kill the boer. Uh, kill the man who works the land and then using the same word uh, to refer to white people. Then you have uh, him singing the song, uh, bring me my machine gun, uh, you know, so that I can kill these people. Uh, then you have a situation in which Julius Malema, the head of the Marxist Economic Freedom Fighters Party, said on the 7th of November 2016 in the town of Newcastle uh, to his supporters gathered outside a, a courthouse, I'm not calling for the slaughter of all whites yet. Now, a, a, a very prominent black tribal leader whom I know very, very well, said to me, Simon, in English idiom, that could mean anything. In our idiom, in black African idiom, when a leader says, I, I'm not calling for so-and-so to be killed yet, it means only one thing to us. It means that he wants us to prepare to execute this when he says the time is right. So that is my sort of long-winded response to your question. Yes, the politicians themselves have been creating the mood for this upsurge in crime and violence, in brutal rape, in the rape of children, murder of children in, on farms and in suburbs across South Africa. Yes. Uh, Julius uh, Melema, he he almost seems like uh, there's 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 this YouTuber who's called uh, Black Hitler, but uh, uh, Melema he seems to be the the actual you know embodiment of you know bl Black Hitler because he's calling for openly calling for uh, a genocide, and that seems to be even though he's only leader of a minor party, he's been able to push the the African National Congress into this. Uh, more radical position, and obviously now with the, the motion, they're they're trying to make it official. Yes, you're you're absolutely correct, and you're seeing something that many white people in South Africa fail to see. The simple reality is that the African National Congress has a, a kind of a manifesto, um, and it's radical in in nature. It's called the Freedom Charter, and it lists the things that the, the African National Congress will achieve for its supporters. And the, the Freedom Charter was written 60 years ago. Um, and the, a lot of expectation was created around the Freedom Charter. We're all going to get houses and schools and land and so on and so forth. But the African National Congress failed to fully realize or manifest the uh, Freedom Charter. And the Economic Freedom Fighters Party, as you correctly say, albeit small, has been able to steal a lot of the ANC's traditional political territory from the ANC. Um, the ANC has been co-opted by money not to implement its Freedom Charter. Uh, you know, they haven't gone as far as they said they would. So along comes the EFF party, <clears throat> and it says the ANC has failed you, they promised you this, they promised you that, they didn't give it to you, but if you support us, we'll make sure that it happens. And they've kind of embarrassed the ANC on the ANC's own terms, as you correctly implied, to follow suit on this land uh, expropriation without compensation matter. Now, in these farm attacks, we're seeing summary executions, raped, uh, burning, and uh, people beaten beyond uh, uh, facial recognition. And it's you know it's been beamed into you know us here in Australia, and it's horrifying to look at. But it must be so much worse the, it, for white South Africans. What is the the mood of the farmers uh, at the moment, and also uh, whites in other areas, such as the major cities, such as Johannesburg and Cape Town? There's a fair amount of anxiety. You know, when people visit South Africa, one of the first things that they notice is the security precautions that whites take um, in the suburbs. You know, high walls around their houses with razor wire above or electric fencing above the wall, uh, vicious dogs, um, panic buttons, alarm systems, 
they're all ubiquitous, absolutely ubiquitous. Everybody has them. It's as simple as that. I can answer you this way. I recently took a journalist around South Africa for about 10 days to show her firsthand what's really going on because the mainstream media, uh, the satanic global capital driven media, that kind of Luciferian consciousness as David Icke calls it, whether you like him or not, whether you think he's crazy or not, he puts his finger on it, has been complicit in ensuring that the truth doesn't get out globally and in South Africa. A few years ago, the government said to the, the media, if you don't tone down your criticism, negativity, pessimism, and so on, we're going to implement a censorship bill. And the media uh, acted accordingly. They obeyed. So even here in South Africa, we don't hear the stories that I'm about to tell you. I took this lady to, to see a, a farm murder scene and she met the family members. I took her to see an attempted farm murder scene and to meet the man. He was shot through the ear and it, you know, the, the, the round missed his brain by a very little bit and so on. And I then took her to see <coughs> or rather to meet um, a, a, a woman, she and her sister uh, have a business um, together who specializes in cleaning up these murder scenes. And just imagine, God forbid, your little daughter is murdered and raped in your house. Now somebody has to clean it up. Presumably, you don't want that job. So this lady does that. And one of the stories she told this journalist was of a whole family that was massacred. And the two-year-old son had his stomach slit open, but he survived that immediate trauma. And he crawled the length of the house, something like 120 feet. It was a big house. And his entrails began to fall out. By the time he reached his mother and collapsed on his mother and died against his dead mother's breast, as it were, his entrails ran all the way down the passageway of the house. He dragged them along with him to die in his mother's arms. Another story that I can mention, they're, they're, they're legion. You know, these examples are semi-random. Um, is of a young girl who was raped in front of her parents. She was uh, four years old, raped by three men, if I remember correctly. Or three years old, raped by four men. In any case, she survived. Can you imagine, physiologically speaking, without being crass, how she must have been ripped to pieces yeah. by these men's yeah. members? I mean, it's hard to imagine that anybody is capable of that level of, you know, savagery and, you know, uh, just... Well, it gets, it gets better, Tim. She survived. She survived the rape. So they bundled her up in newspaper, poured gasoline over it, and set it alight. And that's how according to the post-mortem autopsy, whatever you call it, uh, she actually died. But the stories go on and on and on and on and on. I'm sure you have different other questions. Um, you know, otherwise I could keep you all day with specific examples. No, it's definitely important for, for these stories to be told because there's, there's just so many of them. And that was the first time I'd heard uh, those two stories. And they're, they're definitely the the most disturbing ones that, are, that I've heard. Now, obviously, the international mainstream media has tried to ignore the situation for as long as possible, but it's getting harder for them to keep a lid on it. So uh, last year, I noticed there was quite a number of mainstream media articles on the um, uh, persecution of uh, white South African uh, farmers. But mm. I, then I noticed that the BBC, it was sort of backhanded coverage that, oh, well, we don't know mm. that, uh, statistics. Yes. Uh, so obviously, um, you know, they're they're trying to uh, con uh, contain what's coming out of South Africa, but you're eventually getting the word out. Well, we're trying very hard, Tim. It's it's not easy, you know. The the this kind of globalist conspiracy that incorporates everything from excuse me, sociology lecturers chosen for their tendencies to social justice warriors who are, God bless them, 
highly intellectual but have less intelligence than the chair that I'm sitting on and the media and global capital and so on uh, are a formidable, formidable force all in all. You know, it's very difficult to get this word out. But sooner or later, the facts are going to have to speak for themselves. Over three and a half thousand white farmers murdered since the end of apartheid, the beginning of multiracial democracy, out of a farming population of what is now just about 45,000. In percentage terms, that's unheard of in the world. To give you an idea, a white farmer in South Africa stands a higher chance of being murdered than a policeman in South Africa. To give you another sense of perspective or a different perspective, a white farmer in South Africa, statistically, this is mathematics, stands a higher chance of being murdered than a American soldier in Iran or Iraq. A white uh, a farmer in South Africa stands almost half the chance of being murdered as an infantryman in Vietnam. A white uh, person in South Africa, any white person in South Africa, stands a 24,000% greater chance of being murdered by a black person than any black person in the south of the USA ever stood of being lynched. But the movies are not being made of South Africa. But, but there are racks and racks and racks and racks full of movies, self-recriminating movies like a Catholic monk taking a, uh, something and smacking his, himself over the back. No offense to Catholics. I was brought up a Catholic. I come from a, an Irish Catholic family. That's not the point. But the self-recriminating, self-hating, expiating uh, thing, this exorcism almost that Americans engage in, making all these movies, Mississippi burning and what have you, uh, com is, is, it creates a completely false impression in the world of what is social justice. Um, I think you, you, you understand what I'm getting at in, in response to your question or your observation. Well, I'll play devil's advocate for a moment. There, there's obviously, you know, and this is obviously how toxic the, the left has become in the West. They, they, they would say, you know, to white South Africans, well, you deserve it. You, you know, oppressed blacks under apartheid for 46 years and you just don't like the fact that you don't have the power anymore. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. But I urge you, in the spirit, not even of fairness, in the spirit of arithmetic, to consider the following. Between the year 1820 and, the eight, and 1834, there was a series of wars in South Africa between blacks and blacks only called the Imfetane. In the Imfetane, almost two-thirds of every black man, woman and child were killed. There is no European war in history. There is no European colonization in history. And there is no uh, comparable example throughout apartheid of such brutality. So it's well and good that you say to me that I'm a bad guy because I don't like the Wilms family. Every time I drive past the Wilms house, I say something nasty about the Wilmses or I throw a stone at the front window of the Wilmses house. When inside that house, People are having their throats cut within the family. Perhaps that family, the Tim Wilms family, should get its own act together before it lays this, this, this falsely constructed blame at the doors of white people. The simple reality is that the brutality and the cruelty exercised between blacks in South Africa far exceeds anything that any white man has ever tried to do against black people. And that's not an opinion. It's not a sentiment. It's not a feeling. It's a statement of arithmetic. Stop telling me that I'm such a bad person because I walk down the street and I punch you on the chin when you walk 100 meters further on and you take a knife out and you stab somebody. That this false comparison has to end sooner or later. Nobody is saying that apartheid was wonderful. I wouldn't have liked 
to have been a second class citizen in apartheid. I wouldn't have liked to know that the best that my mother could be was a maid, or that the best that my father could be was a gardener, or garden boy, as we used to call them, a denigrating term. Nobody's saying that apartheid was a ball of laughs for black people. What we are saying is, it's a false comparison. Every single time that this subject comes up, it is implicitly false because nobody is stopping to examine the fact, and this is a, a, a fact, a, a statistical fact, that more white people have been murdered by black people since the end of apartheid, that's now 24 years, than black people were murdered by white people over the 46 odd years of apartheid. In almost double the time, almost half the number were murdered. That's a, an inverse factor, an inverse proportion of four. By their own standards, these evil, evil, evil people, these leftists, by their own standards, not mine, by their standards, what they're saying is devious, duplicitous, double-dealing, dishonest, and deceitful. By their standards, not mine. Yeah, that was a very uh, a a powerful uh, defense there. And it's also worth uh, highlighting that apartheid, it's... It ended 24 years ago, and even before then, there was you know a massive mood not just among um, uh, blacks but also the uh, the white minority that apartheid needed to end it. So most of the people who are being you know brutally attacked today, uh, as you described, you know getting their throats cut, you know raped, like they they had nothing to do with it. They had nothing to do with it, and you know. You can't have it both ways. You can't say throughout the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, with the assistance of BBC, these perverts, the uh, CNN, these wicked, wicked, wicked people, and whatever number of mainstream institute, mainstream media institutions you care to mention in in the northern hemisphere, particularly Europe and, and northern uh, North America that when the ANC assumes power, everything will be peaceful and wonderful and they're really competent, capable people and their hearts are in the best place and you're gonna live in a uh, you know, kind of Elysian field, a utopia. And then when you fail, expect to be given credit for it. In other words, we're trying our best and we've only had 24 years and it's so unfair. And which one is it? You can have either one, but you can only have one. Because the two are mutually contradictory. From your mouth, they are mutually contradictory, not from ours. You were the ones who said it will be like this. And you have not managed to attain a fraction of the level or standard that you and your coterie of disciples of liberals throughout the world promised. You have failed magnificently. And you still want the sympathy 24 years later, you're still the victim. I implore you, Tim, when is the world going to see common sense? Well, thankfully for, you know, people such as yourself and uh, people like me who, are, you know, obviously, you know, it's really sympathetic to what is going on. We have the, the internet and we have uh, alternative media outlets that, and I know that you've appeared on uh, a number of, uh, you know, podcasts and shows uh, uh, from all over the world talking about what is happening in South Africa. And this year, you've also had uh, commentators such as uh, Lauren Southern and uh, Katie Hopkins visit South Africa. And I know that, you know, this stuff doesn't just stay on these channels. It gets shared around on, you know, uh, Facebook while it's still still are still allowed to and you know people you know see it beamed in from uh, their computer so uh, it, 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 the whole rate you know the it's a lovely you know rainbow nation it's you know people are waking up yes. to the, the lie yes and it's and it's a complete lie from from top to bottom there the african national congress has no redeeming features whatsoever except abstract features. So you can say, well, the African National Congress is redeemed by the fact that it is a symbol of liberation. 
Of course, it hasn't been a true liberator. Um, it's a bit like Barack Obama getting the Nobel Prize before he'd done any good works as president of the USA. It's a more abstract con concept and a concrete thing. Um, the, the African National Congress has not one single thing in its favor except abstract ideals. You can say it represents this, Nelson Mandela, what a sweet man, what a lovely smile, so dashingly handsome. But those are not concrete achievements. Those are not uh, 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 expressions of nature and character and what comes from within you. That, that is entirely superficial. The left has used the superficial and the abstract, has used ideals and sentiments to gull and beguile the whole world. And that's, that is why the mainstream media is desperate to ignore this matter, because if the BBC, CNN, Sky News, uh, Canal Plus, whatever in France and Germany and so on, if they began to confess that the new South African rainbow nation was not nearly a utopia, in fact, that it was an ongoing crumbling scandalous scandalous failure they would live it would, would lose i beg your pardon immense credibility in the eyes of the sheep who listen to them because many of the sheep in the world who consume this mainstream poppycock nonsense are old enough to think back 24 years and say but but they were the ones who said it would be hunky-dory they are the ones who said it would be a bed of roses. They are the ones who said we should be looking through uh, rose-tinted spectacles because they're the only spectacles that work uh, in this circumstance. We should be seeing everything as a, a soft ideal. We shouldn't be judging by harsh, empirical, logical, rational, syllogistic terms. And so they can't afford to. They've got to pretend. They've got to pretend. They've got to ignore. Otherwise, they're going to look like absolute fools. And of course, it's not just the, the violence that's been enabled by the, the South African government against whites. It's also the African National Congress. We've all heard about the uh, rampant corruption in government, which led to Jacob Zuma being forced out, and also the, the economic decline of the nation with the uh, uh, currency, the rand, uh, just plummeting, losing uh, most of its mm. value. Mm -hmm. In my lifetime, it cost two US dollars to buy one rand. It now costs about 12 rand to buy one US dollar. So that's a, a 24 times inversion, inverse, uh, inversion of value. We, our sovereign bond rating is at junk status. Our currency rating is at junk status. Um, we have a, a crisis nationally in our water system. I'm not talking about the drought in Cape Town. I'm talking about the water reticulation system. We have a crisis in our electricity system. <clears throat> our government is a shambles. And every day there's something new. There's a bit more decline. Um, the African national, let me put it to you this way. There is a very renowned Oxford scholar by the name of R.W. Johnson, who is also a Times of London correspondent who has lived in South Africa for many years and who was an anti-apartheid activist, you know, stirring trouble as only the media can. Um, and over time, this guy has kind of half come to his senses. He recently said in a speech that the acumen, the administrative acumen possessed by the national government of South Africa, he's a very sober um, steadily spoken guy, very um, serious sort of chap, not given to hyperbole and drama. So he was speaking in literal terms. The administrative acumen possessed by the national government of South Africa is literally lower than that possessed in the average small town in, oh, sorry, a medium sized town in Europe or North America. 
They're hopeless, Tim. They're hopeless. Not because I want them to be hopeless. I wish that my national government were a, was a bunch of absolute superstars so that we could all live happily ever after and that my children would have a bright future ahead of them. But they're not. They're hopeless. They can't get a thing right. Now, I'll talk about uh, your organization now, uh, Zaitlanders, uh, which now uh, people who go onto your website will say that you know, you've got quite an uh, apocalyptic view of, of South Africa. It's about preparing mm -hmm. white South Africans for a pending civil war. But given you know, what yes. we've seen recently, it, it you know, actually seems like the, the sensible thing to do. So can you describe you know, what you do you know, day to day to um, you know, help uh, protect white? South Africans? Saitlanders is a civil defense con uh, organization constituted under international law, particularly protocols one and two, to, one and two additional to the Geneva Conventions, for the purpose of safeguarding the welfare of non combatant civilian white people in the event of a race-based civil war in South Africa. So within international law, we are specifically permitted to exist based on identifiable ethnicity. So we as Jews, pygmies, gypsies, whoever you like, could gather together under international law in the face of a specific threat. Now it so, so happens that we are whites not pygmies or gypsies. And in terms of that law, we have a national emergency plan to take as many refugees as we can out of the cities, out of the densely populated, heavily built up areas, into more remote areas, and to keep them safe there as best we can in the face of an onslaught. Nobody's saying that it's going to be an easy ride, but that is the plan, and it's better than having no plan. And it's certainly far better than planning to stand your ground in your local suburb with your little pistol and nine rounds and think that you can hold out against marauding masses, specifically in, I must emphasize this, circumstances of a race-based civil war. Now, of course, if that race-based civil war never occurs in South Africa, then everybody can laugh at us for years to come. They can say, do you remember those neurotic, hysterical, paranoid, racist, maniac Saitlanders who thought the end of the world was coming? But if we continue to be the most accurate forecasters of developments in South Africa, which we are, regrettably, our main website, we have an English language website, which has a lot of information for people from all over the world to read. But our primary website is in the Afrikaans language. Most of your listeners will not be able to understand Afrikaans, but if they go onto that website and go through our archives, they can see for themselves that there is not one organization in South Africa that comes anywhere near to us for the accuracy of our forecasts. We have a dispassionate, disinterested way of analyzing what is transpiring in the country, whereas almost everyone else you can think of is inclined to be um, tendentious. They're inclined to look at things. They will say, for example, Ooh, the farm murders. Now, that's not very good. But uh, we, we don't reject the legacy of Nelson Mandela and the spirit of the new South Africa. So that's the way that most conservative organizations, most mainstream organizations look at events in South Africa, how they judge them, whereas we don't. We say one plus one equals two. End of story. Now, if we continue to be the most accurate forecaster of developments in South Africa, then there will be a civil war. And it will be just as well that we prepared for it as we are doing legally and lawfully under international law in a Christian, conservative, decent, respectful manner, not gathering together arms and ammunition, pleading to the world for help to raise funds on free starter for diesel, 
That's hardly arms and armor. Medicine and radios. That is the nature of our planet. It is a civil defense plan by its very nature. So one day, we will see who was right and who was wrong. But so far, we've got 19 out of 20 in this midterm uh, uh, English test in Mrs. Jones's uh, fifth grade class. To give a childlike example, this little test, this little examination of whether uh, uh, our approach is valid or not. Now, there's another um, a white civil rights organization in South Africa that's garnered a lot of uh, international attention as, and has been you know, campaigning on behalf of the, the white uh, South African farmers, and that's uh, AfriForum. They organized the, the Black Monday protests uh, against the, yes. the farm murders. Do you uh, have a relationship uh, with them? What's your assessment on um, their effectiveness? No, we don't, because we believe that they're part of the globalist conspiracy. They are very quick to take money from billionaires, very quick. And they're very quick to say, well, we don't like the crime and the violence, but if only we could work together and be more reconciled. And, you know, it's like putting a, a cat and a dog in a cage and seeing the two of them fight viciously and saying, well, then the answer is to make the cage smaller. You, you understand the, the mentality. So no, we are not sympathetic to Afri Forum. We're not on good terms with them. We don't have a specific gripe. We don't have a grudge. We don't go out of our way to criticize them. But when people ask us direct questions on this sensitive matter, we give direct, albeit courteous, answers. And the direct, albeit courteous answer is we are convinced from the clear evidence of where they get their funding, their tremendous funding, and the evidence of what they say, that they are part of the problem. They're a red herring. They're, uh, uh, when all is said and done, although they pretend to be a conservative organization, they're really just a wolf in sheep's clothing. And when all is said and done, they are global capitalists on a global capital leash. When uh, Cyril uh, Ramiosa took over as uh, president from Jacob Zuma, there were all these articles saying, well, is this a new dawn for uh, South Africa? But no soon after, that's when uh, South African Parliament officially passed this motion to confiscate uh, white farmers' land without confiscation. It still has to be go through the constitutional process, but uh, it's it's go, it's going to uh, it's now going through you know legal process to become uh, law so this uh, do you consider this will you know really accelerate the, the the crisis now now that the government has you know basically said yes we're definitely going to do this I hope that you can understand this uh, Tim at the risk of patronizing you earlier on I said to you that you made an observation which reveals that you can comprehend something that most white people in South Africa cannot. I hope that you can understand this. In 2013, December 2013, I was chatting to a senior ANC person and I said something complimentary about Cyril Ramaphosa and this person said, turned to me and said, initially he snickered. And I said, come on, don't embarrass me like that. What are you laughing at? What did I say wrong? You know." Eventually, he said, you whites don't get it. Cyril Ramaphosa is an ANC dog on an ANC leash, as I spoke to about global capitalists on a global capitalist leash. The phrase, in fact, comes from him. He said, you think that Cyril Ramaphosa is a coconut, which is an expression that black people use for other black people who are brown on the outside, but have white tendencies, inclinations, habits, adopt white culture, traditions, and so on. In other words, they're white on the inside. You think that Cyril Ramaphosa is a coconut, but he's an ANC dog on an ANC leash, and you will see that for yourself. We've seen it. He has review, revealed his true colors. Cyril Ramaphosa is not our buddy. He is not the buddy of conservatism. Cyril Ramaphosa is a dyed-in-the-wool trade unionist. In around about 1994, a man by the name of Dr. Mario Oriani, 
Oh, I'm going to mess this up. Ariani Orsini. Ariani Orsini, an Italian guy in South Africa, did a series of interviews with various political leaders and then produced a book about it. And he, amongst many other anecdotes uh, in the book, tells of an interview with Cyril Ramaphosa in which Cyril Ramaphosa said, we have a 25-year plan to get rid of the whites in South Africa. We're, we're almost at the end of year 24. Cyril Ramaphosa said to this man, you know, whites are, for us, they like frogs. Frogs are cold-blooded. So when you put them in boiling water and you start to cook them, initially they don't jump out until it's too late because they enjoy the added heat like a snake lying in the sun. Similarly, the whites will be lulled into a false sense of security by us and then we will get rid of them. That is Saint Cyril Ramaphosa, Pope Cyril Ramaphosa, however you'd like to put it. That is this sweet, innocent, kind, loving, gentle, faultless Cyril Ramaphosa. Nonsense. People must wake up. For bad people to do the things that they want to do or have to do, it is necessary for them to pretend to be good. And the world, with respect, needs to begin to get this into its thick skull. Just because somebody has a lovely smile doesn't mean they're inherently good. It only means they have a lovely smile. And that's why we, we, the, the, the white people of the world, have been so terribly gulled, tricked by the left in this radical transformation that our conservative Christian societies have undergone in the past more or less 60 years because populist Democrats walk onto the podium and they stand behind the lectern and they give a lovely smile and they've got a lovely hairstyle and they blow a saxophone and you're expected to vote for them when at the core of their souls they are perverse representing strictly and solely the interests of global, atheist, humanist, moral relativist capital. Now, the motion passed by South Africa's parliament, it's really uh, opened up the, the mainstream media here in Australia. We had uh, News Corp, one of our uh, big uh, news companies, they sent uh, uh, one of their uh, senior investigative reporters to South Africa to speak with uh, farm victims. And uh, since that report was published uh, just uh, last weekend has become uh, a topic of uh, political discussion uh, in our uh, Newsweek, and uh, many people are saying that you know we should you know have these you know white uh, Sa South African farmers come here as uh, refugees because in Australia where you know we accept most of our refugees from the Middle East and uh, Africa, and they're causing a lot of uh, uh, crime and uh, other uh, integration problems and so people are saying well yes. you know, white South African farmers they you know fit here perfectly I mean you know we play uh, rugby and, and cricket with them and even uh, just yesterday our Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton who's in charge of immigration and refugee programs said he'll look into uh, accelerating uh, humanitarian visas for uh, uh, white South African farmers and we actually at the unshackled uh, it would have been a year, uh, about a year ago now we started a petition to uh, accept uh, white uh, south african refugees uh, uh, what's uh, what's your response and uh, the the people that you deal with uh, you know to you know these offers of you know refuge in uh, nations uh, such as australia do you you know want to you know uh, flee or do you want to stay and fight we disagree wholeheartedly with any immigration, refugee, or asylum type initiatives. We don't say that people should not do it. We do say that promoting it is not the answer. In other words, if you've been raped, or your, your husband has been murdered, or you've been attacked in your house on a number of occasions, then it's perfectly understandable 
that you should want to leave and go to a more peaceful society, which hasn't yet been completely ruined by the radical left, uh, and live there for as many generations as you can before they pervert it. But we don't believe that the answer is to run away for everybody, to summarily run away. We are sympathetic to those who feel they must leave this traumatic environment. But we don't say it's the answer for everybody to run away. We believe that it is right and good to stand like decent Christian white people for the beautiful, beautiful things that our fathers made in this country through faith, blood, sweat and tears and not to capitulate to barbarianism every time it gets tough. Somebody finally has to do it. It doesn't make us brave or even courageous, but it does make us determined to try. Well, it's certainly admirable that uh, you want to stay. And uh, certainly I would say that, you know, the offer stands if, you know, you have, you know, pe uh, people such as yourself and other white farmers want to come to, you know, Australia, you'd be uh, welcomed with, with open arms. And, and there definitely is a, uh, you know, because uh, all these, you know, left-wing groups in Australia have said, oh, you know, this is an example of, you know, um, you know wh uh, white supremacy and, you know, a return to, you know, the white Australia policy. But uh, in Australia, we're so subjected to, you know, our, what's termed anti-white racism. How you know, I'm not sure how much you know about Australia, but you know we're still told that you know we stole the Aboriginal people's you know land, and there's still this you know uh, collective guilt for something that happened you know over two uh, two hundred and forty uh, years ago, and so. Uh, Many, you know, white Australians are looking at what is happening in South Africa and saying this is the logical conclusion of, you know, anti-white racism. This is what, you know, mm. organisations mm. like mm. the Warriors mm. of Aboriginal Resistance would have happened to Australia. And so that's why I think there's this mm. natural sympathy with what's happening to uh, white South Africans. Yes. And I think that you will find that it will increase over time, Tim, as people become exposed to the reality that Sudanese and Somalians are not the same as you. And there's no such thing as assimilation. There is consistency, genetic consistency, between you and me. And so we do things in a certain way, more or less. There's a general trend. You are dealing with people who are not genetically disposed to adopt as if it was their own, your entire set of norms, mores, and values, as they call it. I'm not saying white people are good and black people are bad. I'm saying that if the Chinese developed a society for a thousand years, and then I came along with a few thousand whites and lived in a corner of China, it is pretty certain that my gene pool will not correspond in its behavior completely to that Chinese culture. It is always the case, and it is never not the case. There is no example in history. And you in Australia will learn soon enough that those dear, sweet little Somalis that you rescued from that civil war are not the same as you, and they don't want to be like you no matter how much you might be positive in your mind, that you, sanctimonious, self-righteous, know-it-all, Western liberals, think otherwise. Of course, I'm not really speaking to you, but there is this stereotype, which is not an Australian thing. It is a white thing. It is prevalent in New Zealand, Canada, Australia, the United States of America, and the whole of Western Europe. We are firmly convinced that we know better and what's best for other people. And we are consistently wrong. Now, it's made international news, uh, uh, Peter Dutton, exploring the possibility of taking in white South Africans, and it's prompted a response from the South African government who've said that, uh, you know, they're... Uh, 
you know, inf information about, uh, you know, these, you know, ph farm attacks is uh, not accurate. And they've said, oh, we're, you know, we're a civilized nation, uh, you know, land reform, it'll, you know, be peaceful. I'm not sure how you can basically peacefully steal uh, s someone else's land. And uh, all the, the human rights uh, groups uh, in Australia have said, well, you know, we're, you know, not interested in this, or, you know, this is not our uh, priority. I'm sure you've had the, the, the same same experiences dealing with uh, you know both uh, the government and human rights groups yeah of course of course they the, the thing that terrifies them the most is the truth and so they try very hard to obfuscate to dissemble um, but the simple reality is that the numbers the facts the statistics speak for themselves and we have always erred on the side of caution always there are very very I can't think of any for that matter, instances where people have said, you lied about this. We're always able to say we have taken the facts and the figures from these sources. The government of the Republic of South Africa can say as much as it likes that the, 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 the figures are exaggerated, but we defy the government to then bring the true figures the mouths of the world will be agape. And of course, the government, our government refuses point blank to publish those figures. What does that tell you? Really, Tim, I, I don't mean to get too hot under the collar, but what does that tell you? The government says the statistics that the white conservatives are using are wrong, they're incorrect. But we're not going to tell you what they are. What does that tell you? Uh, I've definitely learned that, you know, statistics that come out of governments uh, are, are not to be believed. I mean, you know, in, in Australia, we're, we're being lied to about the uh, migrant crime issue. So, you know, f it's laughable that, you know, the, the South African government basically says, well, trust us when we say there's no problem. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, you make a fair point, and I, I don't mean to sound as if I'm contradicting you. But when statistics are kind of half feasible, then you can manipulate them. You know, you get lies, damn lies, and statistics, which is the thing to which you were alluding. But in our case, they refuse to present these statistics. They refuse to say the number of rapes of white women that were reported at all of the police stations around South Africa from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. It's not even that they're manipulating the statistics or that they're sugarcoating them. They refuse to reveal them. That's how severe they are. They are not even prone to manipulation. They are so severe that the government can't even begin to prevaricate around them. Now, the nation next door to you, Zimbabwe, would appear to have somewhat uh, realised the, the error of their ways when they uh, dispossessed the, the white farmers under uh, the land reform of former President Robert Mugabe. And, you know, obviously with, uh, you know, their agriculture output collapsing and, you know, we all, we all know yeah. the, the jokes about the, you know, billion dollar uh, Zimbabwean note. And so there's basically been a push to mm. uh, invite them uh, back and uh, provide them with, mm. you know, compensation. Is a mm. you... Uh, is it a satisfactory a mea culpa to you? And also, you know, why haven't the lessons been learned from Zimbabwe by the, the South African government when there's a perfect test case of, you know, what's going to happen? They have been learned. The lessons have been learned very, very well. And this, is, uh, this topic illustrates this concept of white sanctimoniousness very, very well. The lessons were learned in Niger, Cameroon, Togo, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Central African Republic, Chad, Angola, uh, Zaire. The lessons were learned well, but just not in the sense that we believe a lesson must be well learned. In black African culture, it is better to have 100% of 10 
than it is to have 10% of a billion. So it is better to live in your own dung, but to be the master of the dung heap, than it is to have rivals and to live in a mansion. Whether you like what I'm saying or you don't like what I'm saying, whether the sociologists who are listening to this program say, oh, nonsense, whether the anthropologists who listen to this program are horrified and indignant or not, doesn't change the fact. There is no such thing in the African scenario where the powers that be say, ah, but we should never kill the goose that lays the golden egg. That concept is a concept you understand because your mommy taught it to you through the stories of the Brothers Grimm and whatever fables and nursery rhymes and so on you grew up on. That is your culture. Your Weltanschauung, your norm, more value. But you're not always right, to me, whether you believe it or not. There will be rejoicing countrywide when this thing is fully implemented in South Africa. And you will be sitting in Australia. Perhaps not you. I mean, uh, you know, I think you understand what I'm trying to say. People in Australia will be saying, but golly gee, it just doesn't make any sense. Dear me, I wonder why. And all this nonsense. Why can't they see that people are going to die and there's going to be famine? Why can't you see that that's how they want it to be? That schadenfreude is what fulfills them, makes them happy. When you have a situation in which you have very, very few centers of power, centers almost of ultimate power, and then a massive flat base of peasantry that lords, that, that idolizes the great buffalo, the, the, the great elephant, the great rhinoceros, whatever appellation is given to the president at that time. One great African man, one big African man, as, uh, as they call it. That's the way certain cultures want it to be. Whether you, Barack Obama, and the Queen of England agree or not, with respect. That's certainly an interesting insight. Yes, it's hard for us to understand that type of mindset. Well, I'd like to thank you, Simon, for uh, coming on the show today and giving us a first-hand experience of what it's like for whites in South Africa. And please keep safe and continue your work to keep your fellow Afrikaners safe. Thank you very much for having us. If I may just give a last word, if anybody is uh, sympathetic to St. Londers, if you would like to support this desperate effort that we're making to prepare for a civil war in South Africa, please consider supporting us on Freestarter. Freestarter is the world's largest conservative crowdfunding organization. Please support Freestarter. Please support us so that we, the conservative Christian white people of the world, have an answer to the overwhelming deluge of liberal institutions, liberal banks, liberal crowdfunding organizations, so on and so forth. I think you know what I'm talking about. Please support us. We would really appreciate it. Thank you, and God bless you. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As Simon stated, the whites in South Africa want to stay and fight, but if you want to let them know that they would be welcome here in Australia, please sign our petition that we mentioned in the show. It has over 17,000 signatures at present. It can be found at change.org slash p slash Australian government accept white South African refugees to Australia. Our next live stream is nearly upon us for the South Australian state election and Batman by-election on Saturday the 17th of March, beginning at 6pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time, which will be streamed to our Facebook page. So please join us for another night of election result analysis. 
As we transition to do more live events, we are conducting uh, regular live stream tests on our growing Facebook group, which you can find at facebook.com slash groups slash The Unshackled. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled to the next level and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a pay- patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and comments.